Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So in this week's video, I'm talking about acute diarrhea part two. So last week I talked about the approach to history, um, the general um, approach to diagnosis and management and the various risk factors and the triage based approach that I recommend when it comes to diagnosing and managing acute diarrhea. But there really is just too much to include in one video. So I mean, I'm making a second video for today. And um, yeah, so in this video, I'm going to be jumping into kind of the common presentation that I see in primary care and the different tests that we have access to and the approach to testing. So in last week's video, I talked about who needs testing. So go back and watch that video if you haven't watched it already. The moral of the story, there's a couple of pearls I want to give to you in this video to take away. Moral of the story is that most of the time in primary care, people do not need testing. And so I think the strongest value in learning what I have to offer in this video is confidence obviously, confidence with like knowing what you're doing, right? But then also having a confident conversation with a patient of why they don't actually need any testing or treatment or antibiotics. <laughs> so just to start, um, the most common presentation that I see in primary care is in fact, um, people come in in the first 24 hours of having an acute diarrheal illness. They have some sort of wat uh, watery or loose diarrhea, less than six episodes in 24 hours. Again, that's one of the risk factors from the last video. So less than six episodes in 24 hours, either one or two or three. Sometimes they have vomiting, diffuse crampy abdominal pain, no blood in stool, no fever, no mucus in stool, um, no recent hospitalizations, and nothing really contributory in their history. Non-contributory is the little fancy medical word, but um, everything that I have asked from, again, the pre last week's video, all of those history questions, nothing is really coming up, right? They don't have signs of volume depletion. They don't have severe abdominal pain. They don't have tachycardia, orthostasis. Et cetera, et cetera. Those are all the signs of um, an alarming illness or a more serious illness. And so most of the time that's how patients are presenting. They have no comorbidities, they're chilling, right? And so they can, and, and they're scared, they're frustrated, they want to feel better, they want testing and they want treatment. And sometimes they want antibiotics too. And so that's the common scenario that I'm hopefully helping you work through, but also working through the situations when it is a little bit more serious. Although another pearl, like I mentioned last week, if you come into the more serious presentations of volume depletion, fever, blood and stool, mucus and stool, definitely tag, tag a team member in, whether it's your colleague or your supervisor, because it's not that common. And we just want to tread carefully with those more serious illnesses. And I will be double checking myself too, you know, I just don't see it that often. But anyway, so that's the most common presentation. And our job is to reassure patient uh, safely and accurately diagnose them, also provide reassurance for them and education and make the decision about the treatment going forward, right? And those are difficult things to do. And I definitely understand that. I used to be a new grad once myself. But um, but yeah, when it comes to the testing, I was thinking about a couple different ways of approaching this video because the pathogens, this is this is a very old, this is a very broad topic. Um, when I thought about it, doing a video on acute diarrhea, I was like, oh, what a great topic. So interesting, like so many facets. And then I was like, oh, wait, like it's so interesting because it's so complex. The, the approach that I've decided for this video is to start with the testing and kind of work backwards into the pathogens. And I'm gonna give it very high level, and excuse my sniffing, I'm getting over a cold, and non-COVID luckily, um, but is a very like high level approach to the pathogens because if you look, for example, on Up to Date, there is an article about acute diarrhea. There's an article specifically about Campylobacter. There's actually like probably three articles about Campylobacter itself, right? So I'm gonna give the overarching big picture so that you can safely approach your care, but then going forward, you can learn more and more about each of the individual pathogens, right? So what are the tests, right? Get to it already, right? <laughs> what are the tests? So the main tests are stool culture and every patient, almost every patient comes in wanting a stool culture. And so just as an overview, a stool culture is looking for bacterial pathogens obviously, but um, it's actually really looking for three main ones and it's the most common ones in primary care that we see is um, Shigella, Campylobacter and Salmonella. Typically, so and down below this video, actually, before I go any further, down below this video, I'm going to link to a really helpful article from American Family Physician that has a great table of all the different pathogens and all of the different findings between them. Obviously, up to date, if you have a subscription to that too, is really helpful too in terms of identifying all the different pathogens and how it presents. That might be helpful to print out as a cheat sheet to kind of take a look at and see and parsing out between all of them. But for the most part, if you have somebody who requires a stool culture, again, going back to last week's video to refresh your memory about who needs one and who doesn't, 
um, that will look for those top three bacterial pathogens. It does not include every single option. So the other options include viruses um, and parasites and other bacteria. So a couple of other things, and again, looking at those sheets down below to think about who needs what, but just as an example, so Yersinia is a less common bacterial pathogen. Actually, is that a parasite? Don't quote me on that. I don't know that much about Yersinia. <laughs> that is an option. <laughs> don't quote me. Um, but that is from undercooked pork. That is not included in the stool culture. I believe it's a bacteria. Um, <laughs> I also, it does not include Vibrio species, and I may or may not be saying that right. I read things and I pronounce them how I think that they need to be pronounced, but that is cholera. Cholera is Vibrio cholera, cholerae. And it's also, there's a couple other Vibrio species, and that specifically comes from um, contaminated water, but also from seafood specifically, like food poisoning, foodborne um, bacteria uh, from seafood is more likely to be Vibrio. So you need to ask your lab specifically when you send out the stool culture, is there a way to collect that specimen and add that on? So Yersinia um, listeria is, uh, is another kind of bacteria that is less common and less is usually a self-resolving thing that we don't necessarily need to test for, but is one that we can test for with pregnant adults and with um, immunocompromised patients because most of the time with normally functioning immune systems that are in patients that are not pregnant, you um, will not need to test for that because it will self-resolve, right? Um, but that is not on the stool culture. So if you want to think about listeria, you want to add that on. So Vibrio, Yersinia, uh, Listeria, and again, like those are each of those are doorways, right? So if you have a patient in front of you who is in this kind of co complex situation, you might want to order those tests, right? But this is just an overview, right? Because when you come to a patient who actually has this in front of you, then you can decide who needs what other quote unquote fancy tests, right? So that's stool culture. That's a broad overview of stool culture. Ova and parasites is the next test. So everyone wants to order a stool ONP. I always try to order it and my lab rejects it every single time. Their criteria is that they need to have watery diarrhea for two weeks, they need to be febrile, and they need to have recent travel because it is a cost prohibitive test. It is not, it is in terms of the cost to result ratio, they had to put some barriers in place, apparently. So what they do is whenever I order that, they reflexively change it to Giardia. Just hold that thought. Anyway, when it comes to stole ova and parasites, um, all that criteria definitely applies. And for the most part, and truly having an ova and parasites test, Parasites tend to be more ongoing diarrhea, right? So we're talking about like the acute onset situation where you're trying to talk somebody down. Well, you're deciding whether or not it's appropriate to order those tests and then we order them, but most of the time we're talking people off of ordering what tests, right? And parasites, for the most part, are more of like a chronic diarrhea type of situation where that will be quote unquote approved from your lab. Um, so Giardia is another um, parasitic option that is more common in the United States because I'm coming from the United States and that's what I'm talking about. I should have specified that. Um, so recent travel outside of the United States where parasites are endemic are more likely going to be um, approved for stool, stool oven parasites. Giardia is a parasite that's more associated. The classic kind of like textbook situation is when they go camping and it's contaminated water. Dogs get Giardia, things like that, because they drink a whole bunch of stuff, water on the ground, all that thing, all that stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of some other tests that we have. So um, occult blood, a lot of people will order an occult blood test um, because maybe it's not visible, but that helps further inform the full clue of like what's going on. And in terms of the whole picture, putting the pieces together and what we've detected so far, especially if they don't look well, if they have all of those signs of severe illness, things like that. Other tests that you might see, um, that you might consider ordering is called uh, fecal leukocytes or fecal, le fecal lactoferrin, that's a mouthful. Um, and basically what that's looking for is white blood cells in the stool. And I should, I should pause here and back up a little bit. I mentioned this a little bit in last week's video, but there are infectious, there's many causes of diarrhea, right? But if we're talking about infectious, the main overarching ones are infectious, um, inflammatory, and non-inflammatory infectious, but there's also in inflammatory infectious, which I didn't mention in last week's video. But basically there's viruses, which are non-inflammatory, they're just, they're just there. The main difference is that it causes mu um, intestinal muc mucosal damage. And so inflammatory diarrhea can be from intestinal, um, inflammatory bowel disease or intestinal um, uh, ischemic colitis. So those can cause inflammation and mucosal wall damage, but so can Salmonella and Campylobacter. Those are infectious, but they're also inflammatory. 
Non-inflammatory are things like Giardia and norovirus and just the general viral gastroenteritis and some other pathogens, which again is down in that table down below. It's a little bit of an older article, but it's free. So it's down there. But if you have up to date, it's also an up to date if you have a subscription. But yeah, so fecal leukocytes and lactoferrin are looking for, they're not like super sensitive and specific, but they can again add, contribute to that big picture of what exactly are we seeing here. It's like when it relates to is it inflammatory or not, right? And so if we're not if we're not clear on what's going on, that's one further clue to potentially contribute. There's a couple of other pathogens that I didn't specifically man mention that are related to specific risk factors, which again are in that um, article down linked down below this video. Um, one, um, if you have various risk factors, if you have um, anal receptive or anal insertive typically anal receptive intercourse that can have specific um, pathogens that you want to think about. There's also um, Shiga toxin specific E. coli, which tends to have this really severe pain with bloody mucousy stool, um, febrile, and that is a specific test in and of itself. And you just, again, want to ask your lab, hey, I'm looking for the specific pathogen. Where do I go from there? So that's a lot of information that I've just thrown at you. Just to recap, like the most common presentation is somebody who does not need any testing at all. Like period, right? And our job is to assess that. Why don't they need any testing? And do we feel comfortable with that? What are the differential diagnoses? Have we ruled out the worst case scenarios? Do they have the, have we asked all the history questions? Do we know what their risk factors are? Do we know who requires to have a stool test? Again, going back to the previous video, if you haven't already. And then um, once you pull the trigger on that, what tests do you order and who do you pull into the conversation, right? Because I'm not going to order all that stuff without having a conversation with one of my colleagues and my supervisor just to be extra sure because it doesn't happen that often. And it's more likely to be um, on the serious side. But for the most part, the information that I'm giving you is, is to be fully informed and fully comfortable telling a patient they do not need those tests. Um, and I didn't really talk about empiric antibiotics in here. Oh, actually, one more thing I wanted to talk about when, as it relates to antibiotics. C. diff. So C. diff is another important test to consider. So stool culture, oven parasites very rarely is going to be covered. Maybe Giardia you want to ask for specifically or those other bacterial pathogens. Um, but the other one you want to think about is Clostridioides difficile, previously known as Clostridium difficile. And for patients who have been hospitalized for three days or more recently that are on um, chronic gastric, gastric acid suppressive therapy, proton pump inhibitors, anybody? everybody in paid primary care, risk factor for uh, Clostridium difficile, no, C. difficile, whatever. Um, and uh, if they're undergoing chemotherapy for cancer um, and for um, recent antibiotics. So those patients are at risk for C. diff and you want to consider doing a C. diff test specifically for them. I don't really, I'm not really talking about empiric antibiotics in this particular situation and in this particular video because some patients warrant empiric antibiotics, but that is beyond that is, that is like you, that is a pretty sick patient that actually requires that. And I do recommend you collaborate with somebody when you talk about that. There's azithromycin, there's fluoroquinolones, there's all this stuff. I really don't even want to introduce that because I think as I have, I say this with so much love, um, I see a lot of newer clinicians, nurse practitioners, physicians, DOs, PAs, all of that. Um, it's just very tempting to treat an algorithm and go one, two, three, four, five, right? Most of the time people are hyper cautious and they don't want to do anything without anybody's approval, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna draw the line right there. So if you have somebody who needs empiric antibiotics, they are typically quite ill. They typically have blood in their stool, mucus in their stool, fever, or signs of hypovolemia or severe illness. And so definitely collaborate with um, somebody else on that one. But hopefully this video was helpful. Um, if you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patients, stories and bonuses that I really just don't share anywhere else. Thank you so very much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.